Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pooja, and I'm working in Dr. Gayatri Panangar's lab. Today, I'm going to talk about a technique which we use in our lab to see molecules at their atomic level. Uh, and that is how we come to this uh, topic, which is observing atomic picture of molecules through crystals. So, so here uh, you can see stack of bricks, right? So many of you have uh, seen a uh, stack of bricks anywhere in your life. So you can see they are arranged in a specific pattern. So the single bricks are kept uh, in a regular manner at a regular distance and in a particular arrangement. And you can see five different arrangements here, right? So this is how a crystal look, which is the first question, like what is a crystal, right? So this is how you can understand a crystal looks like. This is a 2D image of, uh, you can imagine of a crystal, but uh, this you can imagine in a three dimensional state also. If you put the same stack of bricks behind and behind of each uh, layer, then it will be the same arrangement. But do remember that it is a regular arrangement of individual bricks in a three-dimensional space. That is called a crystal. So now I will uh, give you an example of a real crystal, which is sodium chloride. You all have seen it home. You can make it the crystal. Uh, you can do experiments at your home. You can just uh, evaporate, uh, mix the salt in the uh, water, and then leave it for some time, and the water will evaporate, and you will get the crystals again, right? So uh, here, what is within the crystal? You, you don't know, maybe. And some of you know also. So you can. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. So if you see here, it is a bunch of uh, sodium chloride. Now, if you see a single crystal of sodium chloride, what you will see inside it is the ions of uh, sodium and the chlorides. So you can see two different colors uh, here. Uh, the purple one, which corresponds to sodium, and the chloride, which is the cyan color. So uh, you can see there is a regular arrangement of atoms these two ions, and they are packed in a regular manner. So can you compare this sodium chloride structure with the bricks? Yes or no? Yes. Do you understand what is crystal now? In a, like, this is the basic way I'm telling you. There's much more to tell, but this is the basic way you can understand what is a crystal. So now I will show you some uh, crystals which are found in nature. You, al you already seen salt, right? Now, uh, snowflakes. This is again a very beautiful crystal which uh, is found in nature. And this is sugar candies. You can make this and enjoy it at your home. And uh, these are diamond. It is again a kind of crystal which is made up of carbon. And this is a quartz crystal which is made up of silicon dioxide. And these are kind of stones which is mi made up of minerals, different kind of minerals. But these are polished. So that is why it is looking shiny here and beautiful. So these are some of the crystals that you might have seen somewhere in nature. Now, uh, these are some mineral uh, crystals which are found in nature. But can we uh, make crystals of some other molecules that exist in our body also, like nucleic acids, proteins, like DNA, RNA, and proteins? These things are found within our body and living organisms. You do not see them by your naked eyes. You can't, right? Your eyes are not made to see because they are very tiny. Even using some light microscope, you can't see them. You can use electron microscopy, but uh, even at the, like, you can just see the morphology, but not at the atomic level. You will have to go at very high resolution. So uh, before uh, going to that, I would like to tell you about, uh, because we work with proteins, I'm going to talk about, with respect to protein, how we solve or the, see the picture of uh, molecules with respect to protein. So here you can see different levels of uh, proteins, uh, which is the organization level. So here I'm giving an example of hemoglobin. You know what is hemoglobin, right? What is the function of hemoglobin? It is an oxygen carrier, right? Okay, so what does it uh, look like? 
you must have seen in your 12th class or in your school time also. So this is like a, a, a protein is like, it contains thousands of uh, small molecules together, bind together with a covalent bond, right? So uh, this is what a chain of protein will look like. So this chain is made up of uh, amino acids, which is the building block of proteins, right? And uh, further, these chains actually four folds in a specific manner, which could be uh, in a helical pattern like DNA or just like a, a sheet or a strand, you can say. So these two have a specific name. This helical kind of thing, it is known as alpha helix. And the second one, which is a sheet kind of thing, it is known as uh, beta sheet. So uh, further, the third level organization of protein is the peptide where what happens is these uh, secondary this we call as a secondary structure so this secondary structure actually folds due to a uh, side chain interaction or like the you if you know like the protein amino acids have side chains and that uh, interact with each other and fold in a specific manner and that is that gives us a structure like this which we call as tertiary structure so it is a 3d folding now further several uh, structures like this this 3d folding come together and they form a quaternary structure which is actually the functional unit of proteins now i will show you some crystals which we produce in our lab so uh, first uh, please focus on this picture this is a crystal of uh, enzyme called lysozyme sorry this is typo mistake it will be lysozyme not lysosome uh, so this is the first enzyme which has been crystallized in this world i mean among enzyme this is the first enzyme and the structure uh, or sorry the picture of this lysozyme has been solved after getting this crystal so and these two are the crystals that I have taken from my lab. So this is something you can see, uh, it is uh, like one of my seniors has crystallized this one and this is a crystal that I have crystallized. So you can see different morphology of crystals. Here it is a needle kind of thing which are joined together, which is like a bunch. And uh, here also it is a kind of bunch. And here it is like a brick kind of thing you can say. So in nature or whatever we synthesize in the lab, the crystals, they have different morphologies. And uh, uh, also, these are very tiny. Even after making the crystal, you are not able to see them with naked eyes. You have to use an uh, optical microscope or a light microscope to see them. You can see, uh, like, uh, their scale bar is very small. So this is in a small drop. So these crystals present in a small drop of uh, water, you can say. And this is the boundary of that small drop. So now after uh, seeing these crystals, uh, people has crystallized them, had put uh, lots of effort to crystallize it. But why? There should be a reason, no? We are crystallizing these things. It takes a lot of effort to crystallize proteins in lab. So why we need to crystallize it? The simple question is, you must have understand till now that we want to see the picture that we can't see with naked eyes, right? So uh, here it is, how we use these crystals and see their pictures actually. So you can see at the upper panel is a normal microscopy arrangement that Sanjana has explained already. And here uh, you can see the similarity between the uh, optical microscopy and uh, the technique that we use to see these crystals uh, structure or the molecules of picture. So here what we do, we use X-ray. So X-rays, not the normal light, we use X-rays. So uh, when we bombard X-rays on the crystals, what happens is that the X-rays get scattered in all the directions. What happens if uh, I will say that now you can go out, you can just leave because you are getting bored. All of you will like to go randomly, right? Like, like the children's, they will just go randomly out. So it is just like 
these uh, uh, X-rays are randomly scattering in all the direction. And uh, when we place a film or a in front of it, which is we call as a detector, you can get a pattern of spots. There will be a spot kind of thing that you can get. And it will be of a specific pattern that I will show you in further uh, slides. So next, what we do, we use these uh, patterns which we call as a diffraction pattern or diffraction of spots and then use uh, computational modeling or we, in general we use computers to transform these uh, patterns to a picture. That is a very technical thing that I'm not going to talk about here what we do here but obviously I will talk what we do at this level. So here I have shown a picture of DNA, here it could be protein, it could be RNA. So now when you compare this thing with the optical microscopy, what is similar? You have an object here which is an uh, arrow in red color, now here it is a crystal, right? Now in microscopy you have lens but here we don't have a lens. So instead of lens we are using computers. It is like equivalent. Now further, uh, it gets, uh, releases an uh, image. Here also we get an image. So there is a similarity with little of difference. Now one question here arises, can't we use proteins directly to see the image? Can't we put it, instead of a crystal, we can put the protein directly and then bombard x-rays and then get these things further? Is it possible? So the answer is no, it's not possible. And that is the reason we are uh, putting lots of effort to get these crystals. I will tell you why it is not possible in further slides. So before answering that question, uh, I would like to introduce you with a physical phenomena which is called diffraction. Uh, so what is diffraction? In simple, you can say it is a bending of light when you put an object in front of the light. Okay. So here you see an image. Here what happens? You have a obstacle, this in black color, which has two openings and there is a light source. So when you produce a light, this light will travel and then it will pass through this opening. Again, it will generate two traveling lights. So you can imagine it again in the same way if there is a crowd, like a crowd, and the, in the crowd you will see people are just uh, randomly going here and there. So this is like a random thing, a scattering. And uh, then it is at somewhere this a scattering thing will meet to each other, like crossing each other. Understand? So uh, that you can actually see here when we put a uh, like kind of a plate or a something a screen here, you will get a kind of a pattern, a black and a white pattern. So you will see the distance, the distance from this opening. If the distance from this opening and the distance from this opening in the red color is equal, it will give you a bright color spot. And when this difference is not equal, where here it is in blue color, it will give a black color spot. So uh, what is, why I am showing this? What is the importance of this? So here you can see what happens. So when uh, two light sources uh, interferes with, eth with each, each other. Here what happens, two pheno phenomena uh, can happen. One is the positive, positive interference and the negative interference. So uh, in the positive interference, what will happen? You will see that, uh, you know that light travels in the form of wave, right? So here, let's say one wave is coming from one opening, another wave is coming from another opening. So the resultant wave, if you combine the, these two waves, you will get an amplified wave because these two waves are in phase. What do you mean when we see in, when we see that these two waves are in phase, which means 
the crest of one wave is matching exactly with the other wave and the trough is also matching. So this is called in phase. And uh, this, is, this gives us a positive interference and then we get a bright spot. So this is the result why we get white spot. And here it is a negative interference where uh, the two waves coming are not in phase. That is the crest and one wave of the one wave and the other wave are just opposite to each other. So the resultant wave will cancel each out and it will give just a small line, I mean the straight line and nothing. So it is like a dark spot here. Now uh, when we uh, consider a protein, right? So I asked a question before that slide, like why do we not need crystals? Can we use protein directly? So here is the answer. You can see if you imagine if you remember the brick, the arrangement of bricks, does it look like arrangement of bricks if you consider these single single uh, molecules as a brick? Then it is like a regular arrangement of bricks. Here what happens? Uh, it is like the uh, light scattering after, uh, uh, after bombarding onto these molecules. They will again come in a form of wave. And here what happens? This generates a positive interference. As a result of positive interference, since there are so many molecules arranged in the same way, they will amplify the signal much and much bigger. So that is detectable by the detector. If you will put only the protein molecule, the signal coming from that single molecule is not detectable. And that is why we need a crystal to amplify the signal which we can detect. Another reason for uh, uh, this crystallization is in a single uh, molecule, if uh, you imagine, uh, atoms always are not fixed at position. The electrons, they are vibrating, right? They, you can imagine it lies a moving, they are moving around the nuclei, the electrons. So it is not fixed. So uh, to make them at a the fixed position, we need to crystallize. When we crystallize, they are, uh, remain in a fixed position and that gives us a uh, clear signal, not a noisy signal. After bombarding the X-rays on your crystal, you will get different kind of patterns, which I have called already the diffraction pattern. I have introduced what is diffraction pattern, the spots on the screen. So here I'm showing 2D arrangement of molecules. So you can imagine these dots as single molecules. So if they are arranged in a line, like a horiz horizontal line, what you will observe in the diffraction pattern is you will get pattern perpendicular to this horizontal line. You can see. So this line is horizontal. Now the diffraction pattern is perpendicular to this. Here also you can see that it is uh, perpendicular to this uh, vertical line. Now it is horizontal. The diffraction pattern is horizontal and the line is vertical. Now uh, this is again uh, 2D arrangement. Now you can see as much as molecules are uh, presenting here, the pattern is getting complicated. So now I will show you uh, the th 3D uh, diffraction pattern. So this is an uh, actual pattern that we got in uh, our lab after uh, of a real protein. This is just a presentation, but this is how it actually looks like. So now. Uh, after understanding the theoretical part, how we do, so this whole process is called X-ray crystallography because we are using X-rays and the crystals to get the picture of molecules. This whole thing is called as a X-ray crystallography that we do in our lab. So here I've, I'm showing you how can you uh, get crystals in our lab. So here uh, the protein I'm showing is in the solution form. Now, uh, from the solution form of the protein, how can you get the protein crystal? So you have to put your protein in a particular environment where you, uh, several factors like these uh, you have to maintain that affects the process of uh, crystallization of your protein. So here it could be the temperature which reduces the solubility of your protein and uh, help it to crystallize. I will tell you how uh, it happens actually. 
Now it could be buffers and pH, which actually maintains the stability of your protein. And it could be precipitant. So it is kind of uh, polyethylene glycol and some other precipitant, which helps the protein to uh, get uh, into the crystal by reducing its solubility. So further, there are some metal ions. You know that uh, proteins like, for example, hemoglobin is interacting with hem group. Right, iron group. So such kind of additives can stabilize sometimes the protein structure. So sometimes adding some uh, stabilizers can also help in getting the crystal and uh, uh, the salt also. So uh, now coming to the laboratory uh, way of getting crystals. So have you seen this thing? What is this? Anyone? No? So it is a micropipette. It is called a micropipette that we use to uh, take very small uh, volume of solutions, like in nanoliters. So for crystallization, the, uh, the volume that we use is even a smaller that we can't use this pipette. So what we do, we use robots that we have in our lab that is that makes us able to like take volumes even in nanoliters nanoliter is so small it is very small okay so here i'm showing you uh, the very common method of uh, getting a crystal a uh, very common method of uh, getting a crystal yeah so uh, so I was saying that, uh, so here I'm uh, showing you the most common method that we use for uh, getting a crystal of protein. So there is two ways. Uh, so this technique is called as vapor diffusion. So diffusion you all must have uh, read in your school course and somewhere. So uh, here in diffusion what happens? Solvent moves from one to other to get equilibrium, right? So that is the same thing which happens here. So first focus on this picture where I'm showing a uh, blue color and red color. So here what we do, uh, we take our protein and uh, we take the reservoir. So what is reservoir? So the precipitant, uh, additives, whatever environmental things I have showed you before this, those things combines, combinedly call as reservoir. So we mix the uh, equal volumes of reservoir and equal volume of protein and then we put it on a slide or uh, invert it and put it on a space like this. So this is corresponding to uh, this one well. So this is a 96 well plate. If you can see here, you can see a small well kind of thing and two drops kind of thing. So this is the same thing. So here, uh, what happens? Solvent will start moving because here the protein and the reservoir concentration has diluted half because we have mixed half, half of the protein and half of your reservoir. So the protein is getting uh, diluted here. Now reservoir is also diluted. So what will happen? So the concentration of solvent is higher and in this uh, uh, like uh, reservoir. However, it is lower here. So what will happen? The solvent starts moving from the lower to the higher concentration. And as a result of this, equilibrium reaches and uh, you will uh, get a uh, time or we, uh, it is a very slow process and after some time you will get a saturation point where these proteins come so close and they will pack together to form a crystal. So this is the same way happening but here instead of putting the uh, protein and the reservoir on like in a hanging manner we put it on a platform that's it so uh, this is how we generate crystals in lab now uh, coming to the broader picture of the whole journey it is kind of summary what we do so uh, so the first step to uh, get the crystal is to get the protein so for uh, to get the protein we need to first take the gene of the particular protein that you want and then we put it in E. coli and E. coli then replicates, replicates in medium and then it produces the protein in high amount. So this is what like insert, uh, putting your gene of your protein into E. coli is like in this kind of uh, circular 
structure, which is called a plasmid or vector, is called the cloning. So we do cloning first, and then we purify these proteins using different chromatography techniques, like nickel NT, affinity chromatography, or size exclusion, ion exchange. So these things we do, and then further, uh, we use the vapor diffusion method to get the crystal and then we uh, bombard the x-rays on those crystals and finally we come to the picture of the molecule. So this is the journey of a protein. It, this is how it looks and uh, yeah. Thank you everyone.